First of all, many thanks to the organizers for having set up this wonderful meeting commemorating this wonderful personality that Nigel Kelton was. I had the good fortune of working with him a number of times leading to four joint papers. And as we all know, Nigel was a person who was interested in a remarkable variety of topics to which he contributed remarkably deep theorems at a remarkable pace and with a remarkable modesty. If you look at the last page of the obituary that Jill kindly provided for us, you will see that roughly one quarter of the papers that are documented on the last page deal with what might <coughs> one might call the nonlinear geometry of Banach spaces. The topic I'm talking about is kind of on the fringe of this area. And of course, I don't know whether Nigel would have been interested in this project, but I'm sure if he had been interested and had contributed, it would be a much stronger project. Anyway, so let me begin by mentioning a few names. Before I come to the actual topic of nonlinear Daugavet equation, I will give some background and actually come lunchtime you will probably notice that most of the talk consists, uh, consists of background before I get to those results that are announced in the title. So before getting there, I will recall a number of results and I've listed here a number of authors who were responsible for these results and the new theorems I will mention at the end of the talk are contained in a recent preprint written by Vova Kadets, Miguel Martin, Javier Meri and myself. Let's begin with what is called the Daugavet equation. It is this proposition proved by the Russian in the narrow, not generalized sense, mathematician Igor Daugavet. In his paper, he says this is a, an easy proposition that is at the same time very surprising. And shortly afterwards, a number of papers appeared dealing with the question which other Banach spaces can appear in this proposition in place of C01. And here are some answers from what might one call the Bronze Age of this theory. And here are some remarks. First of all, the interval 0, 1 can be replaced by any compact Hausdorff space that doesn't have isolated points. And likewise, instead of the Lebesgue measure, any non-atomic measure will do. And here are some counterexamples. You see that the reflexive scale of LP spaces leads to counterexamples and all the sequence spaces of L1 and L infinity type. Now, in previous talks, we were told that CK spaces and L1 spaces are sort of bad for the topics that were considered in these talks. But for my topic, C1 and L1 are the good spaces, and the LP spaces are the bad spaces. So you can say one man gathers what another man spills, and in, you'll see later that there are structural reasons why the LP spaces do not work for these kind of investigations. Now another extension is what beyond compact operators. So compact operators work on these spaces that you have seen. Are there any, any other classes? And what was observed already in the 60s and 70s is in all the known examples, not only the compact operators work but also weakly compact operators. On certain Banach lattices, also Dunford Pettis operators work. And Nigel had a paper in 78 um, on the endomorphisms of LP. 
in which he proved a theorem representing those operators on LP, from which he could have deduced that on L1, these capital L1 singular operators, operators not fixing a copy of L1, satisfy the Dagobert equ uh, equation. He didn't observe this in this paper, but he observed it some 20 years later. And he did this at the moment when he had some reason to think about it. And here I recall the result that is in the paper with Gilles Godefroy and Daniel Lee in the Indiana Journal. He used the Dalgavet equation for certain operators to deduce a theorem on lifting isomorphism from quotients to the whole space L1. So in this formulation, there are three words in quotation marks that I'm not going to explain much more closely. It's just that the norm of the isomorphism has to be close to one. The spaces have to be small in some technical sense that is actually defined in the paper and have to be nice in a sense that has been defined by Gilles in a previous paper that's called a nicely placed subspace. And I'll just mention that the classical Hardy space would be one of these nice and small subspaces. So Now, if you look at the counterexamples from the first page, then it turned out that there's not just some co uh, compact operator for which the Dalgovet equation doesn't work, but there's always, one can always find a rank one operator that doesn't work. So this leads to a dichotomy in all these examples. Either a relatively large class of operators works, or the simplest operators don't work. So it was Vova Karets who had the vision of investigating this phenomenon from the very basics of the one-dimensional operators. So he had the idea of defining a Banach space to have the Dalgovet property if the Dalgovet equation holds for the simplest operators available, the one-dimensional operators, the rank one operators. Well, I should say that Nigel is in a way responsible for this cooperation that started with Vova Kaditz, because in 96 I visited Colombia and gave a talk in a seminar and Misha Ostrovsky was also there at the time, and he told me that Vova also worked on similar questions, and then when I returned back home, I received a letter from Vova Kadets explaining his results, and before long he applied for a Humboldt Fellowship and came to Berlin for a year and a half, during which period a number of results were obtained in, in this direction and we exploited in particular this idea of starting from this definition of a Banach space with a Dalgovet property. So first of all, one can reduce everything to operators of norm 1 by a relatively easy convexity argument. And now the, the, I, the, the, the key advantage of this approach is that you can reformulate all this geometrically. And the but really basic lemma for all the investigations to come is that the Dalgovet property is related to a certain flatness property of the unit ball. So I will try to give you a very naive picture of what this lemma says. So this is meant to be the unit ball of a Banach space. And then we have a point, x naught, and we have a slice. What is a slice? A slice is the set of points in the ball where a certain functional attains at least the value 1 minus epsilon. We are typically interested in thin slices. And in case we are dealing with complex scalars, we have to take the real part. Now, the condition here is, given these data, there is a point in the slice such that the norm is almost 2, which means that the average is close to the sphere, which means that the sphere is, is flat in this direction, which is obviously false in Hilbert space. 
It actually falls in finite dimensions of spaces anyway. But this is the geometry that is behind it. And uh, the connection between the two properties is quite obvious because the Dalgovit property starts from a functional and a vector, and this norm equation pretty easily translates into this condition that is given here. And sometimes it's convenient to reformulate this lemma in such a way that if you look at all the z such that uh, x0 plus z is almost 2, then this set intersects all the slices, and this means that the convex hull is dense. Again, it's a purely infinite dimensional phenomenon that this is possible. So, based on this lemma, one can provide more examples, and some of them, actually most of them, are not really straightforward to obtain. Here's the first one, the space of Lipschitz functions on a, say, complete metric space is an example, provided this metric space is a convex subset of a Banach space. And for subsets of L2, or indeed LP spaces more generally, this is an if and only if. It works only for convex spaces. Then the non-commutative analog results to CK and L1 are valid as well, as proved by Timo Eichberg. Further, there are, say, um, not so classical spaces. Here is one. Talagon proved that the three-space problem for L1 is false, and in doing so, he constructed a certain type of subspace of L1 that is an L1 sum of L1 copies, such that the quotient does not curtail capital L1. Now, in such a construction, there are a number of parameters that you can play with and adjust to your needs. And we managed to adjust these parameters to get a space that satisfies the Dalgovit equation, uh, sorry, the Dalgovit property. And obviously, since Talagant proved that such type of spaces cannot contain capital L1, there's a limit to Nigel's theorem on operators not fixing L1. Because here, every operator is such that it doesn't fix L1 because there's no L1 anyway. Still minus the identity wouldn't satisfy this norm equation. Anyway, we got such a space and also a space of this type that even has the sure property, so it's sort of small, but on the, on the, hand, on the other hand, it's sort of big because it satisfies this equation. It's flat all over the place. One comment on one contribution of Nigel in this direction. Let us say that a subspace of L1 or CK or some other space with a Dalgovich property is rich if not only does this space, subspace itself have the Dalgovich property, but also every space in between the space and the superspace has the Dalgovich property. Here's an example. If you mod out a reflexive subspace, uh, sorry, a subspace of L1 such that the quotient is reflexive, then this will be a rich subspace. Now, no talk about Nigel's achievements would be complete if you wouldn't enter the Kelton zone at some stage, and here it is. So you consider the closure of the unit ball of this subspace with respect to the topology of convergence in measure, with the topology of L0. This is the set CX, and Nigel's theory, theorem is that the subspace is rich if it is sort of large, in the sense that this closure contains half the unit ball of L1. Well, actually not quite, because you have to go to one co-dimensional subspaces, but this is the gist of it. And moreover, if you replace L1 by a bigger number, you get the space L1 itself. So L1 is certainly the biggest subspace of L1, but the next best thing would be a rich subspace of this, of L1. 
So this result is contained in a joint paper with Vova Karetz from 2003 and Nigel Kelton, of course. And you can read it there. Well, what you cannot read there is Nigel found this theorem, or a first version of it, of it roughly two minutes after I told him the definition. So, actually this Bourguin-Rosenthal type space is also of a type that Nigel would have liked very much because it's a type of subspace where the unit ball is compact for this topology in, in measure. Relatively compact, I'm sorry, yes. <coughs> so, what can you deduce from all that? Here again is the characterization that I've shown you. And obviously, if you do not start from X0, but it's negative, then you're talking about the distance of the two points. And you see that every slice has diameter 2, which means that such a space can certainly not be reflexive and cannot even have the radon nicotine property. So in a certain extreme way, it is a non radon nicotine space. Another consequence is such a space must contain a copy of L1. So this follows from an iterative construction because not only is it so that when you have such a situation, a point and a slice, and you're looking something at, say, distance 2 from the point, you find just one point, you find a whole lot of points, namely a whole sub-slice of points. So there's a whole sub-slice of points that works, and then you can iterate the construction, and before long you add up, uh, end up constructing a copy of L1 in the space. Vovacadets was interested in all these investigations to prove this theorem. So this is a unified approach to the theorem due to Pershinsky that neither C01 nor L101 have unconditional bases. So both spaces have the Dalgovit property and he proved that a space with a Dalgovit property doesn't have an unconditional basis and then we asked ourselves, can't we go one step further? Because these classical spaces, not only do they not have an unconditional basis, they do not even embed into a space with an unconditional basis. And this can be proved as well on this, on this basis. So now let's return to the Dalgovet equation. By definition, a space has the Dalgovit property if this norm equation holds for a very restricted class of operators, rank 1 operators. And in the examples you saw that actually more interesting operators satisfy this equation. And the theorem says this is automatic. So if things work fine for one-dimensional operators, then things work fine for weakly compact operators and the only property that you use is the fact that the, un that the image of the unit ball has lots of strongly exposed points. So it works as well if the image of the unit ball has the radon nicotine property. This is sort of dual to the fact that a space with a radon nicotine, uh, sorry, a space with a Dagovit property is never reflexive and never has the radon nicotine property. So since the space is not reflexive, weakly compact operators are sort of small. In a reflexive space, it could be the identity, but not in a space with the Dalgovit property. Now, what is dual to this other proposition that I showed you on the last page, that a Dalgovit space contains a copy of L1? It means that operators not fixing little L1 should be sort of small. And indeed, if the operator does not fix a copy of little l1, then the Dalgovit equation is satisfied. This is a result due to Roman Schwitkoi, who was a student of Ovakadis in Kharkov and then a student of Nigel Kelton in Colombia. Unfortunately, he talked too much to Yuri Latushkin in Colombia because he ended up as one of the world experts on the functional analysis of the Euler equation and he has left Banner Spaces and now 
worked on these equations of fluid dynamics with great success. Okay. Now, given that, at one stage we asked ourselves, can we provide an approach that contains these two results as corollaries? Is there a class of operators for which the Dalgovit equation holds automatically that includes, say, weakly compacts and, and one singular operators? And there are kind of two approaches. The one is the approach of narrow operators that come in very many manifestations. There's the book by Beata and Misha Popov on narrow operators on, say, function spaces. Our narrow operators are a little bit different, although they are very closely related in the case of L1. And as Beata and Misha are suggesting, we should have called them kind of Daugavet narrow operators or something like that. Now, there's a superstructure on the class of narrow operators itself, going by the name of SCD operators I'm going to talk about next. This is an idea that was worked out in a paper by Vova Kadets and several co-authors from Spain and Ukraine. And since slices are behind this picture almost everywhere, they introduced the notion of a so-called slicely, countably determined set. So what does it mean? You have a bounded set in a Banach space, and then you might or might not have a countable number of slices that determine the set in the following way. Once you pick a point from each of the slices and take the closed convex hull, then you have recovered the whole set. Now it is practically obvious, well, first of all, it is obvious that such a space is separable by construction. It is almost obvious that every bounded set has this property if the dual space is separable, because then basically there are only countably many functionals up to epsilon. And it turns out, as proved in that paper by Vova and col his collaborators, that the classes of sets and likewise operators I've been talking about fall in this category. So weakly compact sets are fine, RNP sets are fine, sets without L1 sequences are fine, and then later we proved that spaces that have a one unconditional basis are fine in the sense that the unit ball is slightly countably determined. We do not know whether the one is necessary here. So remember that a space with a Dalgovit property, all this is related, as we'll see in a minute, doesn't embed into a space with an unconditional basis, never mind the basis constant. But here it is important that to we consider one unconditional basis. So what is the relation to the Daugavet business if you have an operator on a space with a Daugavet property such that its image, the image of the unit ball, has the property above than the Daugavet equation holds? And this contains all the previous examples because, as you can see from the examples, here that weakly compact operators, uh, weakly complex sets and hence weakly compact operators satisfy these exemptions, RNP operators, L1 singular operators, and therefore this is kind of the theorem that contains all the previous examples as special cases. Actually, I'm a little cheating here because I stress the fact that separability is automatic if this uh, definition is satisfied whereas the this, uh, this space X itself need not be separable, neither need the operators we are considering, neither need they have separable range, but still there's a separable reduction argument. So if you are, have a weakly compact operator on a possibly non-separable space, then you can reduce it to some separable subspace that is invariant and apply it in this invariant subspace. Now I'm getting closer to the actual topic of the talk. 
possible generalizations, there are various, and I'm basically mentioning two here. First of all, I'm replacing the identity operator by another reference operator, and I might replace the linear operator T by some nonlinear operator T. So, this is a very broad approach, so you have to be careful by choosing which G and which T you might wish to consider. First of all, in the linear case, this problem has been investigated by Vova Kadets and one of his students, and they call an operator G that can replace the identity of Daugavet center. I will concentrate still on G being the identity, but now T might be a nonlinear operator, and the setting, the setting of linear operators when embedded into a setting of nonlinear operators can be understood in one of two senses. You might consider the nonlinear operator as a bounded map on the unit ball, or you might, and then you might consider the soup norm, which is just the operator norm in the linear case, or you might insist that the nonlinearity is Lipschitz, in which case the Lipschitz constant will serve as the norm that will give the operator norm in the linear case as well. So we have results on the first type of generalizations I'm not going to talk about today, but for the second type I will speak about the results that we have obtained. So first of all, the Lipschitz constant will only be a semi-norm on the space of all Lipschitz operators unless you make sure that there's some condition making it definite, and the condition here is that we consider only those operators that take the di distinguished point zero to zero, and then it's a norm. So, this is the space of operators that we wish to consider, and this is the question. We start from a space with the Dalgovet property, and now you're asking which Lipschitz operators satisfy the Dalgovet equation. And here's the result. So, what in the previous linear results, what you did is you look at the image of the unit ball and then you impose some conditions saying that it's sort of small. And here the image of the unit ball is replaced by the set you can see over here. So this is, in a way, the set of directions that is important for a Lipschitz operator. And the theory is, theorem is, if this set is small in the sense of the previous page, being slightly countably determined, then the lipschitz daugavet equation holds. And again, this is so if the set is weak, relatively weakly compact, up to a separable reduction argument, Again, this might or might not be separable. However, the SCD condition requires separability. I will try to explain now some ideas of the proof of this result. And I'll begin by introducing what we call a Lipschitz slice. So in the linear case, slices were the object of choice in order to investigate this question and we introduce what you call a Lipschitz slice in the way you can see on the blackboard. So, in a way, you are looking at a Lipschitz functional and then you are investigating the directions in which the, this difference quotient, as it were, almost attains the Lipschitz norm. This is the Lipschitz slice. This is a set that might be the whole sphere. Actually, it's always a subset of the sphere, obviously. Right? So, because all the directions are normalized, we are always in, this, in the sphere of the ball. So, if the, as an example, if the functional is the norm, you get the whole unit sphere. So, these Lipschitz slices retain some properties that are familiar in the linear case. So, although they are not convex, they still have properties in common with convex sets. So here's one that turned out to be very important in all the following proofs. 
if you have such a Lipschitz slice and a disjoint set, then the convex hull of this set will still be disjoint to the slice. So it looks like the complement of the slice is convex. With the help of this lemma, one proves the analogon to this kind of thing. So in the linear case, again, you have a slice, you have a point, you find something such that is, in a way, close to the, the boundary of the ball, to the sphere. And, and verbatim, the same lemma is true for Lipschitz slices. So if it's true for linear slices, it's also true for Lipschitz slices. So this gives us a handle on how to approach this by sort of mimicking the linear proof. So in the linear proof, you have this, and then you have this SCD machinery to go to weekly compact or whatever operators. To do so in the nonlinear case, in the Lipschitz case, we, as, as Kaditz, uh, Martin, and their co-authors did with the linear operators, we first looks as at this auxiliary set, and it is very important to note that this is a bare space. So the closure of the extreme points is a compact set, and then what, is, what remains when you intersect with the unit sphere is a density delta. And why are the extreme points of importance in this setting? where you use slices, 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 if, where should I put this, over there? If you have a compact convex set, whatever, and look at an extreme point, then it's an old classical result of Gustave Choquet that there's a neighborhood base consisting of slices. Right, so and this lemma is used and to have it, we consider extreme points. Okay, and now we introduce this set D. These are those, in a way, nice functionals, such that the linear slice associated with this functional intersects the given Lipschitz slice sigma and it's thin like epsilon. So it's this auxiliary set and here's the lemma that makes everything work. Each of these sets is weak star open and dense and now this is a bare space, the intersection is dense. And being dense it's normal. And now you start from the assumption of the theorem, which says that this set is slicely countably determined, meaning there is a, a, a countable set of slices that is distinguished somehow. And next thing you do is you take some sort of inverse image. So in the linear case, you just take the inverse image of a slice on the T. In the linear, nonlinear case, it's slightly more complicated. Anyway, you end up with Lipschitz slices and you apply the lemma to get a dense set of functionals and uh, I skip the rest because at some point the technical calculations will start. So anyway, this is the idea how to get there. Now, let me use the last 10 or so minutes to explain a variant of this of these ideas, I should say, not a really a variant of the theorem. And I start by reminding you that for a self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space, you can calculate the norm by means of these scalar products. Now the point is that there are Banach spaces for which a similar formula works for all operators. You place the scalar product by the uh, application of a functional towards the image of a vector and everything has norm one. So what is in the curly braces is the so-called numerical range of the operator and the soup, which is abbreviated by V of t, is called the numerical radius. And what I'm saying is that for certain Banach spaces the norm equals the numerical radius. 
In this case, one says that the numerical index of the space is one, and the classical examples are these, and probably they are somewhat reminiscent of the list of examples for the Daugavet property. Now let me add, once you see that there's something of numerical index one, what is the general parameter behind that? Well, obviously, the numerical radius doesn't exceed the norm, and there might or might not be a converse inequality. And at this stage, if you are dealing with real spaces and, re and, and real linear operators, this R might be zero. So there's no converse inequality whatsoever. However, in the complex case, there always is such an inequality, and 1 over E always works. So all the theory was developed in the 60s and 70s by the British school around uh, Bonsall and Duncan, and the numerical index of the space is the best constant that works for all operators. This is the numerical index n of x. So this is a parameter between 0 and 1 in the real case and between 1 upon e and 1 in the complex case. So the, as it were, best situation is when r is 1, when the two quantities coincide. So that's numerical index 1. And there's a relation to this Daugavet business. It's not a literal relation, but again, as proved by the collaborators of Bonsall and Duncan and so forth, McGregor in the 70s, a version of the Daugavet equation characterizes, characterizes on the level of a given operator when the norm coincides with the numerical radius and therefore characterizes numerical index 1 when this is so for all operators. And the version, let me try to catch it, the version of the Daugavet equation is this, in which in the real case you allow plus or minus. So Daugavet says we always want plus or we always want minus, and here you have the choice. Plus or minus might work. In the complex case, you just take in a scalar of modulus 1 instead of plus and minus. So as I said, this is a connection on the basis of techniques, not on the basis of results, because numerical index 1 and Daugavet property are not related. So what is a possible counterexample? C0 has numerical index 1, but not has, does not have the Daugavet property. And uh, the functions, continuous function space from the interval into Hilbert space has the Daugavet property, but does not have, da have uh, numerical index 1. So as, as results, there's no uh, connection between the two, but in terms of techniques and ideas, there's a great many connections. So the property of numerical index 1 is hard to tackle directly, and therefore people have devised geometric properties of the Banner space that would imply numerical index 1. So the most famous of that is what is called the CL property, and a weakening of the CL property is what we call a lush Banner space. So here's the definition, and Let's look at this sort of picture. What does it say? Given two points, well, maybe I'll draw a new picture. So let's start with two points, x and y, and epsilon then the condition is that you find, you wish to find a slice that is thin, so this is where the parameter epsilon appears, that is thin, that contains which one x, so here it is, 
and then you consider the absolutely convex hull. which is this, and the condition is Y should be in its closure. Obviously it isn't, and again this is so because Hilbert space is uniformly convex and doesn't have flat regions, and what this codes encodes somehow is again that the unit sphere is sort of flat. So this is a lush space, and the previous spaces are lush spaces, but the additional degree of freedom that you have using this geometric condition is that you can prove results about subspaces. So if you have, a, for example, a CK space or an L1 space, and you look at what was called a rich subspace previously, then you can prove that also such a subspace has this property and hence has numerically index 1. So we Use this, again in a paper with Cadets, Martin and Marie, to find an example to show that numerical index 1 is not inherited by the dual space. It is so in the classical spaces, but for certain subspaces built on this notion, one can provide a counterexample. Now to finish with, I'd like to show you this theorem, which says given the connection between the Dalgovet property and numerical index 1, that for a lush space, we have not only the linear numerical index is 1, so this would be this, uh, oops, I have a pointer. The linear the, um, numerical index 1, to be 1, um, corresponds to this equation here for linear operators. So, but not only is this true for linear operators, but also for Lipschitz operators. So, in this case, one has Lipschitz numerical index 1, as it were. And this was, as I'm saying here, proved in a paper for real spaces, but as I explained previously, there are sometimes considerable differences between the real and the complex case and we can get it also for complex spaces. So I should add that it, Lush implies numerical index 1, as I said, but it is not so easy to find a counterexample of a space that is not Lush, still has numerical index 1. So these examples exist all the same. Ovakadets found such an example, and the more natural version of the theorem would be if x has linear numerical index 1, then it has nonlinear Lipschitz numerical index 1, but this is still an open question. And I think I'll stop at this point. Thank you. You said that um, you, in the, I'm thinking in the linear situation. You said that if you've got the, the, the space has the, pro the, the, the basic property, then every slice has diameter two. That's right. Well, I guess I don't think you said the converse. I mean, presumably no. there are space, plenty of spaces right. that have diameter. Every that's slice right. has diameter yes. two without yes. the property. Yes, that's right. I think you can take C zero one direct sum with C01 itself using, say, the Hilbertian norm. That would be an example that you are alluding to. Every slice has diameter 2. Still, the space does not have the Dalgovet property. Right. And the other question, if I may, is that I saw the letter D coming, coming in. It couldn't stand for dentable, could it, by any chance? I mean, this uh, seems very D like the dentable property. Some, uh, some slide where you're talking with your diagram over here, you had the letter D, and um, I just forgot what it was, but it seemed to me there was a relation with dentability. Well, obviously there is a relation with dentability, and I was stating the result about the radon nicotine property, and radon nicotine property means that every subspace, every subset is dentable. 
And you could likewise say the unit ball is dentable. This would be fine as well. I'm still worried about the letter D. <laughs> Are there any other questions or, or comments? Gilles, let me give you the microphone. <clears throat> Yes, I, I would like to briefly comment to uh, the relatively compact stuff All that right. I took the liberty of mentioning because here we are in the Calton zone, of course. So Nigel tried a lot and uh, as far as I know and successfully to find a separable banner space so that the unit ball would be compact for some topological vector space topology and without any extreme points. As far as I know, it's an open question. I mean, there were the needle spaces by Jim Roberts and so on, but it would lead to non-separable spaces with that property, and separability seems to provide specific obstructions to this. So the Bogart rosenthal example is has a relatively compact unit ball for the topology of convergence in measure. And Bogart and Rosenthal tried, I think Bogart tried to make it compact and could not make it uh, at the time of their constructions. It's still not known whether there exists a subspace of capital L1 so that the unit ball is compact for the convergence in measure, and that would fail the radon coding property, for instance. And it seems that, I mean, maybe Bill knows more about it or other people in this room, that this field of mathematics is a little bit uh, lonely and left in peace for the moment, and it could be nice to revive it a little bit. I mean, this direction is still full of interesting problems. Thank you. Are there any more questions or comments? Then let's let's that go again.